1014 AD. It is the 34th year of the longest reigning emperor in Roman history, Basil the Bulgar Slayer. At this point, he is nearing the pinnacle of his power, reviving the sharply declining Byzantine Empire and extending its borders to a point not seen since the emergence of Islam. No one dared to challenge him, lest they face a blinding of up to 10,000 of their countrymen. Until someone did. What kind of person would it take to confront the unchecked power of the Bulgar Slayer? Surely not a 12-year-old boy from a small country that has only existed for the last six years. But that's exactly who King George of the similarly named Georgia was. Basil would face one of his greatest trials in this inexperienced youth and its young king. This is the Georgian-Byzantine War. George of Georgia was born in 1002. He was the son of Bagrat the Unifier, who at this point was the king of Abkhazia and the heir of Iberia. Although he was born an Abkhazian prince, by the time he was six, he became the first prince of a country that bore his own name. When his grandfather died in 1008, the kingdom of Iberia was inherited by Bagrat, who unified his two lands into the country that we now call Georgia. Soon after becoming the first king of Georgia, Bagrat decided to unite the rest of the Kartvelian people by conquering neighboring Kakheti and Hereti. They both fell to Bagrat within a few years. But it didn't take long for a revolt to break out in Hereti, led by the prince bishop David of Kakheti and later his son, Kivrake III. At the age of only 12, George was thrusted into the seat of power when King Bagrat died in 1014. The nobles, whose power had long been reduced under the reign of the Unifier, sensed weakness in their preteen king and began picking. Led by the previously disgraced Liptarit Dukes, the nobility filled the Regency Council and controlled the country. They would face their first challenge before Bagrat was even cold. From Hereti, Kivrake III, known as Kivrake the Great, took the opportunity to reclaim his lost ancestral lands in Kakheti. With the absence of central authority provided by Bagrat, the territory of Kakheti was lost without any major retaliation. It's surprising that the nobility didn't try to retake its eastern provinces, especially when considering the aim of their next target. In the year 1001, Emperor Basil and King Bagrat were in an inheritance dispute over the territory known as Tau. When the last Prince of Tau, and Bagrat's adopted father, David III, fought a war with the Byzantine Empire, he was forced to leave his will to the Bulgar Slayer. Basil took Tau upon his death with little resistance, thus beginning the Georgian-Byzantine rivalry. The inception of George's reign coincided with a lost war in the east, in a conquest in the west. Led by Duke Liptart III, the Georgians swept into Byzantine Tau, claiming the inheritance of the young King George. Meanwhile, in the Byzantine west, Emperor Basil was busy slaying the Bulgarians and could not spare the soldiers for a Georgian campaign on the opposite side of his empire. If Basil did decide to overextend the capabilities of his realm, then he would risk incurring the wrath of Al-Hakim, the ruler of the Egyptian-based Fatimid Caliphate. Before starting their invasion, the Georgians concluded a military alliance with this Shia superpower, checking the otherwise reactive Byzantine military. By 1016, the Georgians had successfully kicked the Byzantines out of Tau, Emperor Basil, nearly at the end of his Bulgarian campaigns, decided to continue focusing his attention in the west and not the teenage King George and his many nobles. Since Tau was part of the Kingdom of Iberia and home to a majority Kartvelian and Armenian population, it was easily and willingly incorporated into the Kingdom of Georgia. Two years later, Bulgaria was slain, and by 1021, Caliph al-Hakim was dead. With him went the Georgian alliance. With George isolated, 
Basil found a new dragon to slay. Upon learning of Al-Hakim's death, Basil marched on Georgia, and by 1021, he was at the border fortress of Theodosiopolis. After arriving, Basil refortified the castle, preparing it for a Georgian assault in the unlikely event that Basil does not return. Although George had no choice in this war, he certainly started to champion the cause of the nobles. King George would lead the army of Georgia in the likely event that Basil begins raising the countryside to ash. Before embarking on campaign, Emperor Basil wrote to the King of Georgia, seeking a peaceful return of town and an end to the inheritance dispute. The 19-year-old assembled his small army to face one of history's greatest generals. Basil began his reconquest by raiding Southern Tau, and even the regional capital of Kars. After this, he returned to Theodosiopolis and waited for the trap he had just set. King George arrived nearby. Basil was considered a master of reconnaissance and logistics, but for the first time, the young king of Georgia would catch the old Bulgar slayer sleeping. The Kartvelians sacked the border city of Altizi in retribution before making their return. Basil did not see this coming, but immediately marched to intercept the small Georgian host. He had set the trap. Now the Eastern Roman Emperor was springing into action. In September of 1021, Basil caught up to King George on the swampy banks of the Palakazoya Lake. The King of Georgia was completely taken by surprise. The back half of his army fell under an attack from Basil's vanguard. Led by Duke Liptart III, the de facto ruler of Georgia, the rearguard held their ground, while young King George made a daring escape. Although the Kartvelians were ambushed, they formed a strong enough line to hold off the Byzantine charge. Their greatest advantage over the Georgians was their cavalry, and in the Sheremni swamp, their mobility remained at a minimum. With the battle being a test of men on foot, the Georgian mountaineer infantry, wielding their trademark maces of many different makes and models, successfully repulsed the Byzantines. Duke Liptart had a chance to make a run for it, Instead, he decided to make a last stand to ensure the safety of King George. Despite being the head of the otherwise corrupted nobility, Liptarit was willing to give his life for the young king. The duke waited in his swamp while the rest of the Byzantine army reinforced the vanguard. After reorganizing his force, Emperor Basil ordered for another charge. Even with more cavalry at their disposal, the Byzantine mounts were rendered useless by the marsh. The Georgians, despite being outnumbered three to one, were now heavily entrenched and ready for a fight. And a fight they would give. Maces now clutched, the Georgian shield wall held their ground in the muck. Basil watched as his army failed to surround the small force, as the Georgians showed no early signs of low morale. The Bulgar Slayer ordered for another withdrawal. With his unit disappearing around him, Duke Liptarit and his bloodied and exhausted force prepared for another assault. Emperor Basil started a slower approach this time, allowing his cavalry to fully outflank the Georgians before beginning the third charge. Now surrounded, the Georgians made their heroic final stand. The infantry still showed no sign of breaking. Despite their hopeless position, the fighting lasted for a few hours, but it was only a matter of time. Soon enough, the maces in the air were few and far between. Duke Liptarit died in the latter stages of this slaughter. The Georgians surrendered soon after, but at this point, barely any of them remained. Although defeated, the rearguard had done their duty. This 300-esque battle gave more than enough time for King George to escape. Basil had his first victory in this war, but it didn't even feel like one. Half the Georgian army was eliminated, but at the cost of a large portion of the Byzantine infantry. Basil's main target, the King of Georgia, 
was out of reach, but this only served to anger the Bulgar Slayer. The Emperor laid waste to the countryside of Tau, raiding for the rest of the campaigning season before crossing the Pontic Mountains and plundering down the coast until wintering at the city of Trebizond. While the army was put to hold by season, the navy had no such deterrence. The Byzantine marines raided up and down the Abkhazian coast. King George could do nothing but watch and wait while he assembled a new army. He had outlasted the Bulgar Slayer for a year, but there was no doubt he would return. Before Basil could leave his winter rest, he had already made another successful subjugation in the east. The Armenian kingdom of Vasparukin was falling under constant attacks from local Kurdish communities, as well as a new threat from the east. The Seljuk Turks, originally from the Eurasian steppe, had started invading the region. With no hopes of defense, King Senekirim simply gave Vasparukin to Basil, in exchange for a sizable estate in Anatolia. This would have no impact on King George, if it was not for his wife and the mother of his children, Mariam, the daughter of King Senekirim of Vasparukin. Her marriage was no longer strategically viable for a king in the midst of a war with the local superpower, so he divorced her, sending her back to her sellout father. Mariam was gone, but soon enough, she would return. Instead of looking south for a marriage alliance, King George looked opposite. On the northern side of the Greater Caucasus, there are a people known as the Alans. The nobility of the Age of Migration, these people were originally from the plains just north of the Caucasus Mountains. They spoke an Iranian language and had a mixed Caucasoid Iranic heritage. Today, many regard the Ossetians as closely related descendants of the Alans. Princess Alda of Alania was married shortly after the divorce of Mariam. Soon they would have their first and only child, a boy named Dimitri, planting the seeds for a future succession dispute as George now had two firstborn sons to two different princesses. First and supposedly most important of which had no familial lands of their own. With the Allens allied, the Georgian army grew in strength in their most lacking department, cavalry. The stout Kartvelian infantry was now complemented by horse lords from the Eurasian steppe. As far as rebuilding the Georgian army, this was a good start, but King George would need to form a bigger coalition if he was to defeat the Bulgar Slayer. To secure his eastern flank, the young king allied his fellow Kartvelian rival. Kivrake the Great of Kakati Hareti. With the Georgian infantry reconstructed, King George was ready to confront Emperor Basil on his own terms. As King George started his march into Tao, a much more pressing issue came to the forefront of Basil's long list of problems. Nikifor Xiphias, one of Basil's greatest Bulgar slaying generals, revolted in nearby central Anatolia. Alongside him was another general, Nikephorus Phocas. No, not Emperor Nikephorus Phocas, but his nephew. Although the Phocas dynasty had been removed from power, Basil allowed their descendants to remain active components in the military. This forgiving policy was finally falling apart in the midst of a war with Georgia. Basil didn't even have a chance to confront the two rebels before Xiphias killed Phocas thus taking away more than half of the revolt's following. The traitorous and now murderous general was brought to Basil in chains. The emperor showed forgiveness again and exiled Xiphias to a monastery, where he would live the rest of his days as a monk. In 1022, King George sent letter to Basil that he was prepared to enter into peace negotiations. This was all a farce as King George arrived in Tao soon thereafter, he marched directly to Basil's premier fort of Theodosiopolis. Basil reached word that George and his army did not arrive in Tao to discuss peace, his informants bearing witness to Allen cavalry alongside the Kakadian shields. 
The emperor moved his army between the Georgians and his regional fort, encamping on the outskirts of a nearby town called Sphindax. No matter how large the army George could assemble with his caucus allies, Basil's would always be larger. He slept well that night, confident that the young King George would not be so foolish to attack. Shortly after Basil awoke, the Georgian army was spotted across the plain. The Emperor's intel was wrong. King George had just ambushed the Bulgar Slayer. Now playing his own game, the Byzantines frantically assembled a resemblance of a battle line just outside their camp. The Kartvelians alongside the Allen horsemen committed to an all-out charge on the disheveled Romans. George's alliance crashed into the Byzantine lines, and after a fierce melee, the coalition was getting the better of the Bulgar Slayer. Basil called for a retreat, seeing his downfall at the hands of someone who was barely an adult. King George had just defeated one of Eastern Rome's greatest emperors. The Georgian and Allen cavalry were sent forward to take the prize of looting the Byzantine camp. Leaving the Georgian infantry alone, and in the middle of an overexposed field. Basil watched from the nearby forest, waiting for a moment like this to counter ambush his less experienced adversary. As the cavalry was distracted looting, the Varangian axes collided with Kartvelian maces. Using his cavalry to outflank the Georgians, Basil surrounded King George on three sides. His infantry was losing ground and quick, all while the horsemen watched on and continued to plunder. Crying for help, the cavalry finally assembled to attack the rear of the Byzantine army. Their greed would cause them to be weighed down. As the horses did little but trot while carrying hundreds of pounds of gold. The charge was lackluster. King George called for a withdrawal from the battle that was all but his to win. George's army had been all but destroyed, making their retreat to the nearby fortress of Sionis. After losing the Battle of Sphindax, King George considered continuing the fight that he had been the sponsor child of since he was 12. When Basil arrived, the 20-year-old king put down his sword, surrendering at last to the Bulgar Slayer. He would prove to be Basil's last major rival. The war reparations were harsh, and at the peace table the Byzantine Emperor was unforgiving. Tao was of course returned to Basil along with much of southern Georgia, including Javakheti. George was also to give up his firstborn son, named after his own father, Bagrat. This four-year-old would live as an honored guest in Constantinople. The Georgian-Byzantine War was over, but not yet was this the end of Georgian-Byzantine conflict. The king returned defeated to his shrunken country, while George moped along, the head of the Georgian Orthodox Church, St. Melchizedek, was eager to make amends with the wealthy and Christian Basil. He arrived in Constantinople in 1023, no doubt checking in on the captive Prince Bagrat. Soon enough, Basil granted Melchizedek the funds to construct a cathedral in Georgia called yeah, I'm not even going to try to say that one, but it translates to the Cathedral of the Living Pillar, which is pretty cool. This religious overtone at the end of the Georgian-Byzantine War was supposed to smooth over the recently rocky relations, and it did, but not for long. In 1025, Emperor Basil died a month shy from 50 years reigning as Eastern Roman Emperor. Shortly after this, Prince Bagrat was returned to Georgia, but not without a hiccup. The new emperor, Constantine VIII, recalled the Kartvelian prince to remain as a hostage. But he was too late, and King George would not give up his son before starting another war. We already talked about the descendants of one of the great dynasties of Eastern Rome, so why not talk about one of the earliest members 
of an even greater dynasty, the Komnenoi. Strangely, his name was also Nikephorus. Nikephorus Komnenos, that is. After King Senechirim of Vasperukin gave his kingdom to Basil, it was placed under the protection of Nikephorus Komnenos. In 1026, however, he was caught plotting a revolt. On a more serious note, he was caught talking to King George of Georgia without permission from the emperor. Komnenos was imprisoned and brought before Constantine, who ordered for his blinding, alongside eight of his other co-conspirators. After this, he is never heard from again. As George and Byzantine relations were boiling to the point of another war, King George was assembling another coalition army to finally subdue a basalless empire. But just before he declared war, he unexpectedly died in 1027, at the age of only 25. Suggesting foul play in the form of Byzantine spies, or more likely, his own nobles, who felt as though that they had lost control over their figurehead king. Either way, the nobles would get what they wanted, as King Bagrath IV came to the throne at the age of only nine. George would be buried alongside his father at Bagrati Cathedral, but his tomb would be robbed at some point. His coffin remains empty to this day. George was the first king of a country that bore his own name. He was a brave king, if not stupidly so. He took on the greatest emperor of the greatest empire of his day, and he nearly came out on top. Although his nobles had chosen the war, King George would champion their cause after Duke Liptarit gave his own life for him. I view King George as someone who had too much ambition for his own good. He was trying to turn Georgia into empire. The time would come for this, just not because of King George I. If you'd like to support this Stoic Historian, feel free to do so on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month and join Derek Clark, Savak Leo Nazarian, Taj Guilford, Nick Mate Voicean, Lazarus Dykos, and Dave J. Or become a YouTube channel member like Derek Clark again, Donald Vincent, and what? Why? Thank you guys for supporting the channel, I really appreciate it.